Thank you for joining Microsoft Security Office Hours. We're going to start recording today. If you'd like to remain uh, with your camera off and um, come off mute if you have any questions, but you will be recorded and displayed to the world. Take it away, Caden. Awesome. Let me get my screen shared out. And I had an update that does not agree with the beta version of Teams I'm using, so I will be turning my camera off. And then if I can just get a thumbs up when y'all can see me. Okay, cool. Seeing some, some thumbs up. So today I wanted to talk about collaboration governance. Um, this has been incredibly relevant over the past two years, especially with hybrid and remote work and learning. Uh, surprisingly enough, my conversations have not, you know, lulled at all. I'm talking to a lot of schools, K-12 and higher education um, around moving to the cloud or consolidating on SharePoint and OneDrive. Um, or looking at teams for collaboration. Um, so, you know, very largely this conversation is still happening. A lot of people are looking at modernizing. They're looking at cutting costs from on-prem file servers. Um, and their big question is always, how the heck do we keep our data safe? How do we know where it's going? Um, how do we know that we're not just opening it up to the entire world? Um, you know, questions around keeping that data safe and making sure that your users can still collaborate and you don't have a billion help desk tickets because they need to share this one document and they can't and things are getting, you know, slapped down by DLP. Uh, but before we jump into all of that fun stuff, um, I do want to just break down the different tools. Obviously, we are all here because we know Microsoft, uh, but I love this chart because it breaks down how the different tools um, come together. So we've got Microsoft Teams that allows for file collaboration and storage. Um, the back end of that in you know one-on-one -on -one chats is OneDrive for Business. When we're looking at Teams chats, um, channel chats, we are seeing that those are being stored in SharePoint Online. When we're looking at the calendar that's interfacing with Outlook, um, when we have uh, you know, chats happening when we're using eDiscovery, it's actually pulling logs of those chats from Exchange Online. And yes, Fergie, I will actually provide this whole document to you. Um, so a lot of these compliance tools um, come together and, you know, when we have eDiscovery, it's looking at, it's pulling team stuff from hidden files in Exchange. Uh, so all of this maps together very closely. They're very heavily dependent on each other. Um, when we're having issues sharing files in Teams, we're not just looking at a potential Teams issues. We're looking at OneDrive for Business, SharePoint Online, information protection. Um, so knowing how this all plays together is very important. And I will share out um, this for you as well, because it goes into like Microsoft Planner and how that all plays together as well. Um, so now we're going to jump over to the fun stuff. I don't want to bore y'all with Teams and OneDrive for Business. Y'all love SharePoint Online. I do know that. Um, <laughs> thank you, Scott, for throwing that link in there. Uh, so let's go over the different capabilities that we have around information protection and compliance. Um, so this graphic right here is a fantastic breakdown of a simple environment where we've got two different groups. Um, one is our anti-money laundering team for this bank. So this is stuff that you probably want to keep internal. Um, it's going to be highly confidential. Um, you know, stuff that you don't necessarily want to share with guest members, external users. You don't want uh, users to be able to share files outside of the organization from this group. So how are we getting these silos, these different silos? Because this is a group that's probably connected to a Teams and a SharePoint site. Um, there's probably a group email for this. 
how do we make sure that we're keeping all of this safe and hidden from this group that is including our guests and our external uh, members? Whoop, too fast. There we go. Um, we will skip down to this one. Uh, so with Microsoft Information Protection and with Data Loss Prevention, um, Data Loss Prevention is included in the A3 licensing. There's advanced features in A5 and then um, MIP is involved or included in the A5 license. Just want to let you all know that. Uh, we can start looking at automatic labeling um, to protect those documents that do need to be kept in, you know, internally. We can look at protecting Teams channels with these labels, SharePoint sites, um, you know, getting those labeled and siloed off so that when somebody, you know, externally does come into your organization, they're going to be blocked off from this uh, through your policies. Um, but looking at this workflow, um, user A has some documents that so they're sending in an email. It's unlabeled. Um, they're going to be prompted to label it or use automatic labeling. Um, that label data is either going to be then, you know, saved to their OneDrive, saved to SharePoint, um, going to be sent out through Exchange Online. Um, you know, if it's public, or confidential or anything that you have said, hey, this is allowed to go outside as long as it meets these requirements or it's encrypted, um, that flow is going to happen there. And then when we start looking at DLP after that label is um, attached to that document, that email, whatever, uh, we're going to see that, okay, this policy is looking for SSN and DEA data. Um, and this one is looking for a label that is marked as highly confidential. So if um, it matches any of these sensitive information type, the drug enforcement agency number or the social security number, it's going to check those files. Um, if those files do not contain those, it's not gonna get um, hooked with this. Um, it's not gonna get captured and saved and protected by this policy. However, even if it doesn't have these and it still has that highly confidential label, it's going to get protected under that policy too. So when we start looking at that workflow, um, we see here, we follow down, um, we've got these OneDrive files that are public, marked public in general, so they're not going to be grabbed by this, but then we start looking um, at these files here and see that it was incorrectly shared. It's highly confidential, so the policy is going to remediate that. And then going, you know, following the outgoing mail as well, uh, if I send something to you that is marked as Microsoft highly confidential, if I send that to anyone outside the organization, I'm going to get stopped pretty quickly by a message similar to this. Um, and it's going to stop it before it even has a chance to go out to these users. Uh, the next uh, solution that we have is our retention policies and our retention labels. They are two different things. Um, so we have, you know, our retention policies that are going to assign that setting at a container level. So a SharePoint site has a retention policy for five years. Um, a retention label is going to look at the item in that container. Um, so if it is an Excel spreadsheet, please don't do this, an Excel spreadsheet that has uh, student data in it, personal data in it, and you need to keep that for X number of years, you can apply that retention label um, to keep that specific file safe. But if that is on a SharePoint site labeled, you know, student information, uh, we can go ahead and apply that policy at the um, container level. And then this just breaks down how it's applied, what's the persistence of that, um, the retention period settings, meeting regulation compliant, regulatory compliance requirements. Uh, we do now have additional features um, where this can be done automatically based off of um, 
we have a certain user that's leaving the organization. And we know when this type of user leaves the organization that their mailbox needs to be put on a um, hold for X number of years. Um, so we have the ability to automate that now without having to go through and make sure that we've got their OneDrive saved and um, their email saved. We can set that automatically now. Really awesome feature. Did I go too far? I did. And then here is that flow broken down a little bit more of retention policies. Uh, so we've set this site to be retained for two years. Um, and then we have this site set to be deleted after seven years. Um, retention, it's going to retain this site for at least two years. You can't delete it any sooner than that. But here it's going to go through and do that cleanup after seven years. Um, We'll jump over to the retention label. Um, so label application, we can see that we have a label policy that manually applies or is applied in apps. Um, we also have the auto labeling policies that we can set. And again, that's going to be at the file or document level. And then we have the ability to do preservation locks. I'm not gonna go way too deep into this. Um, let's jump over to information barriers. Um, so we have these two teams here. We have our financial advisory team and our investment banking team. We do not want them talking to each other. We don't want them looking at each other. Uh, we need these files to keep be siloed off. Um, and we can do that via information barriers. So we can define those segments using Azure AD attributes. We can define and apply that information barrier policy, um, you know, saying, hey, we're going to block certain segments, but allow this segment uh, and then it will take that flow across the board. Here we have our communication compliance. Um, our communication compliance is one of those tools that has just silently gotten way better. Um, and to see them grow and evolve over the two-ish years that I have been working with them is really, really interesting. Uh, so we can look here that we have uh, two policies in place. We have one based off of regular regulatory compliance policy and then one based off of sensitive information. Um, those can apply to um, you know, different items, whether it's a user's inbox, whether it's files, whether it's group chats um, or conversations, we can go through and make sure that, you know, people aren't talking about specific sensitive information, that people in this group can't talk to this group, um, you know, about what's going on on this team. Uh, and then we have the ability to come in and, um, you know, follow that in the unified audit log. Um, this one has gotten a lot better when it comes to the OCR capabilities as well. Um, so if I am sending a picture with something that violates either one of these policies, it's going to be able to catch that for me. And then we do have our insider risk management um, portal that is, I don't want to say fairly new, but it's gotten fairly popular. Uh, this is going to help based off of different signals. You can tell this is an older slide because they're calling it Microsoft Defender ATP, um, but they're going to be pulling in signals from devices. It's going to be pulling in signals from our people printing, copying, uh, these documents out. Uh, we're going to be looking at data loss prevention. How are they sharing it? Is it being downloaded from an, uh, to an unmanaged device? Um, if you have this integrated with your HR tool, uh, we're going to be able to see that we have a departure flagged in there, retirement, um, and then all of a sudden, you know, John Smith is put in for his retirement and we see a huge amount of data um, being printed. You know, that's 
kind of obvious to us that we should take a look at what's going on here. Uh, we also have the ability to look at information protection. That's going to pull in that offensive language classifier. You can have custom uh, trainable classifiers as well. Um, and you're going to be able to pull in additional data sources. But it's going to take all of those signals that are. All right, hand off the mouse. Did I? Uh, it's going to take all of those signals and use machine learning um, to look at the behaviors of those users. Is this typical for this user? Uh, I always make the joke that if you see me on doing something suspicious at 3 a.m., it's not me because I am tucked away in bed, nice, comfy, and asleep. Uh, but it's going to take that, hey, is Caden signing in from... Virginia, where Caden lives, is Caden signing in at a typical time when Caden usually signs in. Um, and it's going to learn over time uh, to say, yes, this is weird behavior. But now that we're looking at it and we're seeing that Caden has switched to another department or has moved across country, you know, it's going to learn that that's my behavior. Um, and then we have, you know, the risk management piece where we're going to get alerts. We're going to be able to uh, look at the cases, work on investigations, take actions from insider risk. And that just work, walks through the workflow of that. Again, I'll share this for you. Um, we do also have the ability to ingest third party application data with um, connectors that will allow you to import um, and archive third-party data. And I think that is the end of that PowerPoint. So we're going to go ahead and stop presenting, and I'm going to take a look at chat. Um, how does information barriers work with address book policies? I think I got that answered. Um, found the documentation. There's it. Step one says no exchange address policy bookmark policies are to be in place. Let's stop the recording for these questions, and that way everybody can. Yep. Perfect.